Hello, and welcome to Data and Society's Generative AI and Labor Impact Series. This is the final of three conversations on this topic. Today's discussion will be focused on adaptation. I'm Ai Han Nguyen, the Labor Futures Program Director here at Data and Society, and I'll be your host along with support from Tunika Ona Kikami and CJ Brody Landau from our events team. I want to also acknowledge the support of the Ford Foundation for making this series possible. For those joining Data and Society events for the first time, Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. This year, DNS is turning 10, and I'm excited to be celebrating the anniversary with this event. You can learn more about what we've accomplished and where we're headed on our website, datasociety.net. Uh, we've curated this series in response to questions received about data and society's thoughts on generative AI and its potential impacts on workers and the workforce. Uh, amid the flurry of hearings, opinions, and debates about this topic, there has been scant discussion about actual experiences, and we are early in our research about this emerging technology. Thus, the series was born with the aim of shifting the focus towards those already doing this work, those not being heard yet, and those impact most impacted. These are exploratory discussions to orient the debate and share concrete experiences and evidence to date and to map opportunities for workers. Today's final discussion will explore the dynamic, contested, and layered relationships workers and professionals have with technology on the ground in their everyday life that transcends predominant narratives. Um, during our discussion, we'll use the chat feature to post links and ask you to share your experiences. To ask or upvote questions for us, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And we've set aside time at the end to address these. And with that, let's get started. I'm very excited to introduce our speakers, Jeff Freitas, longtime educator and president of the California Federation of Teachers, data and society researcher, Livia Garofalo, and Quentin Stainhouse, legal scholar and co-director of the Suffolk University Law School's Legal Innovation and Technology Lab. Thank you all for joining us today. You can learn more about each of our speakers at the link in the chat. Um, and with that, we can start our conversation. And I would love to start by asking the speakers um, if you could introduce yourself. How did you come to think about AI and how do you see AI tools affecting your occupation and work? And I will start with Jeff. Welcome. Uh, good morning here. Good afternoon, uh, probably to, the, to most of you. Um, uh, my name is Jeff Freitas. As was said, I'm a high school math teacher by trade. Um, uh, so a little bit of technology background. Uh, computer programmer for a very short period of time. A, a computer major for a short period of time. Um, and uh, the seeing AI through the lens of a math teacher, uh, my initial reaction was, th this is like a calculator. How do we teach math with a calculator? Um, actually, I'm not that old, so I've never really learned how to take a square root of a number by hand. Um, uh, but I do other calculations by hand. That was my simple initial reaction when ChatGPT came on the scene. Um, uh, when English teachers were like, how do we uh, use this technology or prevent uh, the cheating of this technology. Um, and that's part of the basic, I would just say the basic uh, conversations we're talking about. Uh, the first use um, concerns of ed for educators, uh, two largest concerns, how do I ad identify an address like I was talking about students use of AI. And the other part of that is our concern about job replacement with AI. And I think that's very broad throughout labor, this concern about job replacement. And I think that's one of the things, or th those are the two areas that we immediately, immediately look at. The next part is how do we use this tool to expand, um, to improve our teaching ability, our classroom um, uh, situation, our students' um, access to a very useful technology. And I use this, I come at this from a, a technology advancement. Um, some analogy, like um, 
200 years ago, if we wanted to go 100 miles, it took a couple of days. If we want to do that today, it's a couple hours. That's technology advancement. Um, we see that as an improvement. But we also, fusion or fission and the in invention of that could give us power and energy, but it also could be destructive. That's, I think, the big question of how we need to look at AI. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'll turn it over to Livia, who's done research with therapists to talk about her research and how she's approaching this from that perspective and that profession. Uh, yeah, thanks, Aya, and uh, wonderful to be part of this conversation. Um, so I speak, I'm a researcher at Damon Society. I'm not a therapist. I'm a researcher who's uh, done work in the past uh, year with uh, therapists um, for a forthcoming report that will be coming out in May. Um, I am a cultural and medical uh, anthropologist, so I've been interested in how people treat and experience illness and distress more generally. And we see now how algorithmic systems are part of how people are receiving care and delivering care, right? So there, these systems and AI tools are being uh, implemented in both sides of, of medical and care and psychotherapeutic interactions. Um, so I interviewed mental health providers uh, about their work and how they are adapting to um, teletherapy and platform therapy, but also how they're viewing some of these generative AI tools as sort of within this replaceability discourse that that Jeff um, Jeff mentioned. Um, the AI sort of algorithmic system is already being perceived and used in affecting uh, therapist labor in this in the sense that it's being used for client therapist matching. Uh, scheduling uh, and sort of all the other aspects of therapeutic um, sort of management of the practice. Um, but this sort of wave of generative AI and emotional chatbots is something that providers are sort of trying to reckon with as they uh, try to understand what is therapy in this new um, in this new realm of um, kind of what um, historian Hannah even calls auto intimacy, right? The ability to be in relation with a, an, an automated system that, you know, you, where you're literally having generative conversations, which we could say are, which, you know, a generative conversation is a therapy session, one could say. So uh, it's been, uh, I'm really curious to engage in this conversation because these professionals like therapists are also facing similar, um, similar challenges as teachers and lawyers and sort of the devaluation and adaptation of expertise and sort of professional um, skill. Thank you, Livia. Um, Quentin, I think uh, we'll move on to you. And you're also from a profession that may have some of these similar uh, generative conversations and generative um, discussions as well. Yeah, so so I, I come at this as a lawyer and computer scientist by training. Um, I spent 12 years in legal aid, helping people mostly with a very broad range of housing problems. And now I'm co-directing the Legal Innovation and Technology Lab at Suffolk Law School, which includes working with students. So I think about it from all those different lenses. Who are the people that that we're helping who need legal help, who can't afford it? How should we be thinking about using it in terms of teaching? And how should we be thinking about it in terms of the general uh, group of practicing lawyers, people who are going to be encountering opportunities to save time and gain efficiencies with the help of generative AI? as well as maybe having their work challenged and um, maybe devalued in some ways, right? So uh, my work focuses quite a bit on the access to justice problem. That's that that huge gap of folks who can't afford lawyers. We know that lawyers are very expensive. And one of the primary tools that I've been using in that research and work over the last uh, half a decade or so, and a bit longer, is a very well understood tool, which we used to call AI, the expert system. Um, often what we're doing is we're helping walk someone through a problem step by step, produces a document at the end that can then be filed in court. And these court documents can contain quite a lot of sophisticated reasoning and, and thought. And essentially, the judge should be able to look at this document and decide, does this person win or lose their, this case? And, and very often. So these can be very sophisticated. And we used to call these AI. I think now with generative AI and machine learning, even over the last few decades, we've been talking less and less about those as being AI. I think one of the things that we can do with generative AI, though, is to help improve, make those tools better, 
make them less rigid, make them easier to write. That's something I'm really interested in and I think really relevant to the work that we've been doing. And the other real out reality here is that people are going to misuse uh, generative AI uh, to do things like create fake citations. We, we saw lots of folks, including Donald Trump's uh, lawyers, getting in trouble with, with this in recent uh, months. And people are going to be using ChatGPT to ask for legal help and maybe putting themselves at risk of getting misleading or wrong information. I think all of these are, are there's ways we can help avoid some of those risks and we can do that through education and through changing the ways, maybe it's some guardrails on these tools to make them easier to use safely. But I think that's where I'm coming at it with those kind of mix of concerns and optimism. Great, thank you so much. Thank you all for sharing that. And Quentin, I think you alluded, you you mentioned uh, something that maybe is now a good time for, for us to dive into and I'll start with you since you brought it up. Um, there, an issue that's uh, sort of, you've mentioned in there and not as visible in the public discourse around uh, general AI is the issue of access and equity. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about how you see equity and access in your profession and what role AI could play in that? So despite it might seem like there are so many lawyers, maybe too many lawyers that we, more than we need for our country, the truth is that it studies, Legal Services Corporation ha, does this survey periodically. Their most recent one showed that only 8% of the legal needs of the poor were being met it, with the help of an attorney. That means 92% of those problems are just going unaddressed. And if we look globally, the World Justice Project, they they show about two thirds. They didn't limit their, their uh, efforts to just looking at the problems of the poor. But uh, two thirds of problems are addressed and unhelped by an attorney. So there's this huge area of legal work that's not being done right now that potentially could be done to help people. And these are really high stakes issues. They're things like whether someone has custody of their children, uh, whether they have a roof over their heads, whether they're going to be evicted or be able to stay housed. Um, sometimes we we call guardianship petitions, for example. Those can be called sometimes civil death. Someone has the right to make decisions over their own autonomy taken away. These are all things where no one has a right to an attorney in current systems. People can hire one if they can afford one, but often they don't. And as a result, we see 80% of people who do make their get their problems into the courtroom go without the help of an, of an attorney. So if we can tackle part of that problem with automation, including the older systems like document automation that I, that I mentioned, and we can improve and speed up that work with the help of generative AI, that's a huge boon. And it's something that doesn't necessarily challenge the ability of people to, to work in the legal profession, because those are problems that are just going unhelped at all right now. Thank you. Um, I'll turn it, I think we'll just head back in the other direction. So Livia, do you want to contribute to this from your perspective? And then we'll move on to Jeff after that. Yeah, this is a very interesting um, point about access, which is very, I mean, similarly, right? Mental health access is something that is a, a huge problem in the United States. And we know um, the uh, how unequal access is, right? And this goes from basic access to services, but also reimbursement rates, what is actually, what kind of psychological and mental health care is reimbursed. Um, and so there is sort of, the, especially during the pandemic, I mean, there was this sort of window of also opportunity to test out some of these virtual virtual tools. I mean, even just providers, um, you know, shifting their practice online. Um, and, you know, with that, there's also this, the reality of behavioral workforce shortage, which though also gets sort of uh, mobilized uh, in some of these narratives about, uh, well, something is better than nothing, right? Um, which could be true for different kinds of issues, but when it comes to mental health care, right, there is not all, and again, I speak as a, as a researcher and not a, as a provider, but not all help is equal, right? Um, and so there's there's can, there can be sort of justifications that some of these companies that are modeling um, these tools can sort of leverage to um, to say, well, you know, we have a provider shortage. 
providers are burnt out providers some some people are don't don't want to even enter the profession so what if we just kind of shift some of the people in that need access will get the sort of ai therapist and so you can see how easily that can be in a sort of such an unequal um unequal country how that can really re-entrench some inequalities about um healthcare access and mental health access um so yeah that's sort of I guess that's the more, more critical, more critical stance, but also a therapist that I've spoken to are, were, um, some of them were also excited about these integrations, right? And sort of using some of these tools as a bridge between sessions, for example, uh, as, um, you know, not replacing the, the prof a professional, but sort of integrating and helping, um, sort of check in with, with their clients and patients. Jeff, I think uh, we often hear about a similar teacher shortage and huge drives to try to get more people into teaching. Um, how are you seeing this access and equity issue in education? I mean, that, that's a great point. Um, we, we do have an education staffing crisis. Um, we initially look at this um, as a, a student, you know, from the student's perspective, um, we see as an opportunity of the close in the digital divide. We saw through uh, during COVID as everyone went online, what were resources and the, the lack of uh, underrepresented communities did not necessarily have the resources to be able to be in the classroom at home, uh, Wi-Fi, bandwidth, technology, all of that. And so we tried to provide those. And here's another question. Does this close the digital divide? Does it help it? Does it provide a technology? Or, or assistance that they normally wouldn't have, or because of that lack of, of resources, they don't have that access and it creates a bigger divide. That's something we definitely have to address. Um, do I have an answer? Does it help or not? I, I think that time will tell, just like COVID. I think we have to, our job is to make sure that this doesn't increase the digital divide that we provide the resources for these communities to actually close the digital divide and whatever resources all students have, um, act, uh, that, that everyone has access to that. And it also, in another part of, from the pedagogical perspective, this need, we need to make sure that policies are in place that it enhances the differential learning. Every student learns a different way, that it doesn't become, uh, we, we can use this technology into a rote system and a homogeneous uh, educational system. And that is the wrong way to go. We have to be able to use this so that there is, um, this becomes a tool in the toolbox for our educators to be able to differentiate this learning. Um, uh, in our elementary classrooms, you have learning pods and they're doing different things that need to continue. So it's not just the same thing being provided um, uh, to all the students. That's kind of the look we uh, part of the uh, equity and, um, and access. We also need to make sure because just like all of our systemic uh, our, our systems uh, throughout our country that the systemic racism isn't imbued into this creation or whatever resource that they're using. We need to be mindful of that and that there's diversity of thought that goes into, the uh, AI basically is a collection of knowledge and information and, and uh, disseminating that or uh, processing that. We need to make sure that's very diverse um, in, in terms of uh, its creation and um, access and use. So those are the thoughts that we think about um, and the, the, the issues, the equity and access for this. And, and as a participant, and I turned to Quentin not to take this, but um, due process uh, in criminal cases and would laws be allowed to use an AI attorney um, if you have a you know you write of an attorney in a criminal case would a state allow that to happen uh, just something to throw out there in, in terms of uh, the legal aspect of it sorry <laughs> no I think that everyone's had some good thoughts there too. And I, it's really important to make sure that if we're providing something new, it's not going to replace or supplant higher quality levels of service, right? Um, I, we've been having this conversation in the legal industry for decades. Um, people often feel like, well, if you add this this new thing, it's going to not be as 
good. Therefore, maybe we shouldn't offer it. That's gone from things like legal help websites to limited assistance clinics, and now to tools like generative AI. And on the other side, you have people who are um, maybe looking for ways to cut back on resources and spending and are, are really eager to find something that's more cost effective and, and they aren't necessarily worried about whether the quality is as good. So it can be used both ways. I do think that one in the legal industry, we're really far behind on that idea of having commodified consumer type services that people look for are and enjoy using, which is true in many industries. Um, there's certainly lots of educational tools that you can get that have a very consumer friendly interaction. I think that's maybe less true in, in terms of therapy and mental health, but there's all kinds of innovative ways of delivering it, right? Like people can can use uh, BetterHelp, for example, or some, something like that, where it's made very simple to get help in the comfort of your home. Legal aid, uh, legal services, we're delivering them like one-on-one -on -one with a, you know, go to the attorney's office, you pay 300 bucks an hour to have someone handcraft the result you want. Well, maybe people don't need that for something like a divorce or for an estate plan. Uh, they're able to get those tools in a consumer-friendly way. They prefer it. It's It's better for them. It's more cost effective. And I'm really excited for the potential of AI to help us deliver those choices to people that better fit their goals and needs and to move away from everything must be bespoke and, and handcrafted because that can't scale. It can't help us solve and close that access to justice gap. And it actually might be a lot better for folks, at least some of the time. And I won't say it's universally better, but people might prefer it, even if it's a little bit worse, <laughs> if it's saving them a lot of time, mental energy, mental, uh, resources, and money, they might prefer that kind of prepackaged legal product versus the, the uh, old fashioned way of delivering it. In terms of whether we're, we're gonna see a robot lawyer, well, there's some folks who've, who've tried and cl made claims there um, and then kind of spectacularly failed. The, the legal industry is this guild where we've set up all these rules that makes it very hard to do something that's practicing law if you are not a licensed lawyer. So I'm not holding my breath for that one, but I don't necessarily think we need to just imitate that old fashioned way. I think these newer models that are, you know, safer, that don't require that exactly imitating the way a lawyer would deliver the help are more promising to me. Olivia, I'm wondering if you wanted to add anything from uh, from your perspective on sort of the uh, different tools and maybe less bespoke models of providing care. Yeah, it's interesting um, because there's this idea, right, of um, expertise, right, and and gatekeeping, right. I mean, what kind? What are the professions that really have to go through an intense training uh, and educational accreditation and sort of what is at the core of their knowledge and what they do? And and I think you're right, Quentin. What we're seeing, which seems like not as much as in the legal profession and in, in medical care, even and and psychological care, right? The direct to consumer plug and play model has really entered with force in the last, I'd say, even pre pandemic. And so the pandemic really offered this test bed case of like, it's now like we need to, we as and also some of these corporate actors, like it needs to happen now, because we have this window where the field is being disrupted. Um, but yeah, there's no, there's also no denying that some of these structures and, you know, older models of, of expertise and licensing also were not open to everyone. I mean, there were inequalities in the professions before these systems, right? I mean, for psychotherapy and, and mental health care, sort of supervisory structures, there's a lot of, you know, uh, debt that providers have to encounter. And so I think it's, it's a good point to sort of um, point out some of the things that were that are that predate the AI sort of AI era that were already in inequalities entrenched in some of these professions. Um, in the case of sort of therapeutic labor, some of the what what's happened is that um, with the entrance of some of these platforms, um, the actual um, even monetary value of an of a billable hour right is diminished, which is something that really affects the livelihood of providers which means that they need to work more and more hours, which then gets sort of into a question of ethics and and um, which I know we will speak about, about later, but um, 
I think it's 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 interesting to compare fields of practice and where they are in sort of addressing some of these uh, these issues. Thank you. That was a great back and forth there, and I think it made me um, want to deviate just a tiny bit from the questions that we have. But I'm sure you're all prepared to talk about this. But it kind of goes along this question of oh, if there is um, uh, overwork what then makes sense to be automated and what doesn't? And what is it that we would uh, need to preserve or think about in that process? Because it seems like this panel is not clearly pro-automation or anti-automation. There's a need for both. I'd love to hear from you where you sort of see those lines or where you think those lines should be, should be drawn. And um, since we started with Jeff and Quentin, I'll start with Livia. Um, yeah, this is something that the providers um, that I spoke with uh, had different feelings about, right? And the work of a mental health provider, and it depends really in what work setting they're they're working in, right? There are some people who work in private practice, some people work in community mental health, other people work in, you know, are doing this patchwork of, of platform work, but administrative work is a huge part of this of the labor right and it meant much of that is also writing therapist notes and some of those therapist notes the purpose of them are obviously clinical but a lot of them a lot of the purpose is also uh, reimbursement and insurance and so some of the providers were you know were like well if you know there could be a way to for <laughs> some kind of assistant for me to write the notes where I could save time you know I wouldn't be totally opposed to that um, but also not where the session is recorded and there is an auto generation of those notes. So there's these really like fine lines and sort of um, that really for psychotherapy and mental health care have to do with ethics and privacy, which is I know we'll touch upon this, um, but privacy confidentiality are at the core of some of the, you know, even the trusting relationship when provider between provider and client. And so um, I think it's interesting to see what providers also were aware of the automation that was happening in some of their platform work. You know, mu much of it is, is occurring, but it's opaque to them. They just see, for example, the scheduling that is something that they don't have much control over if they're working for platforms or this algorithmic matchmaking um, that they would, you know, sometimes appreciate, but also want clinical autonomy over. So it's not, I feel like it's not uh, a one, one, one moment decision, um, but autonomy, especially when it comes to some of these micro decisions is what I really sense these providers were, uh, were talking about. And, you know, automating therapy in general, is something that they, um, obviously they, they feared ethically also for the well being of their clients and patients, um, in addition to their replaceability, but it was a really an ethical concern about what happens, whose liability is it if something happens, which we have, we have cases, we have, that's already happened in some cases. Jeff, uh, would you like to jump in? I know we've talked a little bit uh, about sort of what exactly, what are the actual jobs that are being affected by generative AI in education? And how you would think about this question of where does the line, where does that line sit? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I, I think at this point in time, uh, people want people <laughs> connecting their, to their kids. Um, they want uh, they want humans. Um, there There is a, a fine line to tutoring. There are th discussions on that, um, assistance with um, the, the subject matter. But the day to day in the classroom that we don't see that uh, being replaced uh, anytime soon. Uh, there are, as you talked about, you know, automation, um, you know, library places, admin assistants in our schools, um, uh, uh, attendance people. That seems to be the t the trend that could be easily replaced. We would be pushing back because you need those humans there, even in the contact with that student walk into the office. If you automate a lot of that you automate the library situation, you're removing that human contact. And that's what schools are about, really connecting. It's not just the academic, but connecting students to other people and learning um, through those diversity and thought and that, that interaction. Um, in terms of the automation question, 
uh, you know, there it, it could be a huge tool on you understand your subject, but to be able to write a lesson plan, just quickly have the chat GPT create a lesson plan or create a test or, or create these things that could help um, the daily processes. It's like your emails, you know, I have a, a quick response, AI, you know, simple AI responding to these emails. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those, those things that you can click on your email or your, your Gmail account just to reply to people. But there's a couple of concerns about that. And, it, one, it's not, you know, it's not my full thought of reading through that email to reply to them. Two, uh, that company is reading my emails <laughs> and has all of that information um, to be able to respond to that. Translate that to education, those things that we put the system into, whether it's automation and we go down this path of, you know, using automation and becomes more easier, more simple. And, and more often used, are we getting into a path that we're releasing this private? And I know this is a whole uh, other question, but does that automation and daily practice of that automation make it easier to do more and more into this world? And then we start stop questioning ourselves, that are we giving them all of this information and privacy? I know that's a whole other question. So those are uh, kind of answer a couple of your questions. Um, the automation question and the replacement question. I think we have to be very careful and thoughtful at each step of the way. Thank you. Yeah, I think you mentioned at some point, you know, what do you want our campuses to look like? What do you want schools and universities look like? And I guess I could send the same question over to Quentin. What does a courtroom look like? Um, where is the AI in the courtroom? Yeah, I think it's it's behind the scenes for the most part right now, which is which I think makes sense. Um, when I talk to lawyers in law firms, I do some consulting work. And early on, after all this excitement about ChatGPT, they came to me. They're basically, their question was, can we get a clone of myself? Can I can I train an AI to read all of my briefs and to write briefs that look the same, you know, with, with have the same tone and have this high quality? I was like, well, that's not really how it works. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is a, a fear that lawyers have is this study that Goldman Sachs came out with early on in 2023 that said 44% of legal tasks could be automated, which is an astoundingly high number. But what are those kind of tasks? I think they're the same kind of routine tasks that, Olivia, you were talking about that a therapist may be willing to put down for the most part. Um, and Jeff, I, I really empathize with what you were thinking about with, I, I certainly use chat GPT when I'm working on uh, a, a new syllabus or a new lesson plan, um, as a starting point. Sometimes it's really good. Sometimes it's at least let me think of five bad ideas that I'm not going to do. <laughs> and it's gotten me started on it. Um, that's where I like to use the open-ended chat bot tool is to let me get unblocked on ordinary tasks where maybe I would bother a colleague for them before to get an, some input, or I just be like thinking about them and mulling over them for a couple days and not getting started. I, I think it's, it's really great for helping you. Okay. Well, this is what I need to do. I'm not going to start on my own for a couple days at least, because I am just kind of stuck. Tell me what I should do to get started with it. Give me 10 ideas. Um, give me feedback on this draft for the millionth time tell me if I'm on the wrong direction or what would be less persuasive or more persuasive to a jury, for example. If I had a closing argument or a brief that I was writing, um, you can get pretty good critique that's not gonna necessarily try to spare your feelings from chat GPT. Uh, um, and you can get maybe some ideas of like, okay, here are all the facts. What's the narrative that's gonna persuade people? Uh, that's where I see it. I, I, I do think that there's room for it inside um, the judge's chambers. Uh, it's an interesting one. I read a really interesting study that uh, paper that I reviewed this summer was talking about all of the uh, fascinating ways that judges are already using chat GPT, often quite unsafely. And they were focusing their study on Latin America, but I think it's happening elsewhere. Also, um, they shouldn't be using it to make decisions, to do legal research, but there's some of that happening. And I think the newest wave of commercial products, uh, the, the biggest legal research companies, LexisNexis, uh, Thomson Reuters, 
who, who makes Westlaw, they've been integrating generative AI into their tools. To the extent that people are using those tools, they have some more guardrails on it and can do it safely. And that would include judges. Whereas if they just open up chat GPT and say, tell me how I should decide the standard, you know, does this person qualify under this law without actually having the law provided to chat GPT, it might just make up what it thinks the law is. And that's, that's a, something that we've seen happen in some of these cases that I saw in the study. So I, uh, specialized tools are going to help us get there. I think that's a big part of it, but there's still lots of ways every day folks can use it to reduce the friction in their daily life. Thank you. That was fascinating to hear how you're all approaching that issue. And it seems like everyone has alluded to it. So I'll ask the question. Um, it seems like in each of these, uh, these occupations and industries, I see an example of how we can very clearly think about ethical AI systems through the lens of the ethical codes that each of your industries um, uh, abide by. How could you see ethical issues, including the importance of privacy expressed? How would you want those ethical uh, issues to be understood in by, in, in by you know, regulators and builders of AI systems? Um, I, do, I, think we, I think we'll start back with Jeff, maybe. Does that make sense? I, I lost track too. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, th this is a great question, um, and um, <clears throat> privacy, prejudice, uh, predictive behavior, I think, are, are the, the kind of foundations of this ethical code. Uh, replacement um, is, is an issue. I, I kind of go with um, where do we draw the line? One of the questions in the chat, where do we draw the line? I think you have to develop baseline rules um, as we're using this, because we're, we're starting to use this without these baseline rules, either personal or organizational or systematic. And I, we have to be thinking about these ethical codes, codes to create this. If a, if a school district brings in AI and it's a tool, um, what are the baseline rules that we're going to do that? What is, is it going to, some of the things that AFT is working on, one, promote human interaction individually, individuality, to how does this create and add to that, how does it empower the educators to make educational decisions? And is it used for that, um, the advancement of equity and fairness? So these ethical codes, I think we need to get in front of and create ourselves for whatever system that we're doing to make sure that these are the, and I, I think the other questions about guidelines or guardrails, but um, how do we, like one, one other example is how, how do we make sure the schools uh, advance democracy? Because that's what the schools are for. So, um, in, in I know there's classic examples of Isaac Asimov and that we can look to the past and past writers um, of what we're looking at in the future, but those are the ethical codes that maybe we need to be looking at um, to make sure that we're using it in the right way and that we know where that line is to cross. Because if we don't have those rules, we don't have those beliefs, we don't have the, the those standards, then we don't know when we cross that line. And we need to make we need to know that as as we're moving forward, we need to do that soon. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think about an education where you you don't really have the right to say no to anyone, right? Education is public education is for everyone. So that the in my mind, it makes me think the systems have to be cognizant of sort of how it's being applied universally and not just in sort of a bespoke manner. Um, sorry, little commentary, <laughs> not part of the questions, but um, I think maybe there's there's something also to this idea of like how that relationship between uh, provider, teacher, therapist, lawyer, and clients, and that there, there's an ethic there. And I don't know if Livia, you can talk to sort of what that relationship means and what therapists think about as their ethical duty to um to uh to clients and how that can inform ai systems yeah i mean and and just a specification that when i'm talking about therapists it's it's a very broad category right the profession itself is quite fragmented there are many many different kinds of credentials trainings approaches orientations and um also it's a profession that is um state by state right every state has a licensing board um more and more um sort of credentials are going through 
um, licensing that is national. For example, there's something called SIPAC for people for, for the psychologists. But the, it also presents like who is actually, you know, there's the code of conduct and, and these guidelines, but then, you know, once a threshold is, is crossed or there is, for example, you know, liability, um, it goes back to individual states. So some of these AI systems and even platform therapy kind of challenge, you know, this, um, you know, this anytime, anywhere model, which actually is still quite um quite rooted in in geography and topography of where you know provider and client actually are i think what's interesting um is that therapists now you know have all, always worn many hats but now are also become data brokers right if they are working for one of these platforms they also are you know their the liability of the individual but we've seen uh, for example some of the big platforms like BetterHelp um, and the FTC ruling, like some of these platforms have sold um, data to uh, to meta and large social media companies. And so there is, you know, a lot of repair work that the therapist has to do reputationally, not for themselves or in addition to themselves for the company, right? So there's, um, you know, definitely feeling that they want to be more included in how the, in how, the lay their labor is structured but also one thing that's happening is that they're being sort of tapped on by some some companies for their input right and i there was one therapist who was kind of on the fence about this it's like well if i don't participate right in one of these um companies that's building an emotional chatbot clinicians won't be included but then i am also giving uh, away and I'm sort of feeding the model that will contribute to my replaceability, but also I, I don't know, I can't follow the whole process throughout. And so this is something that professional associations are very concerned with, but also are a little bit behind. And the therapists on the ground who are doing the work are seeing are seeing the effects um, quite urgently. Thank you. Um, Quentin, uh, legally, you've already mentioned some of the concerns, like not using such systems to make decisions. Can you expand a little bit more on sort of why you feel that that's an, maybe an ethical concern from your perspective or from lawyer's perspective? Yeah, I, I think that's one of the biggest concerns really is bias. And, and we saw this in some of the earlier machine learning systems that, you know, this kind of algorithmic approach to deciding how dangerous somebody is. The compass system is was one of these early ones that was used for setting bail with a really terrible record of including, you know, not relevant information like uh, race and uh, the place where someone lives in, in a way that had a very disparate impact on on who was sentenced for, for how long and, and when, who could get bail. Um, the truth is these systems are quite biased. And there's lots of ways that that's expressed that can be very dangerous in terms of allowing any kind of automated decision making. Can we improve the training and safety of these systems? Maybe. Um, you know, we don't quite know yet how large language models work. We know how to make them. Um, and but seems to help them improve in performances, ingesting huge amounts of data. The chances of us removing all of the biased data from that training data set is practically zero if we really wanted to. And I, I don't think these big tech companies are going to because it's going to instantly, you know, they're they're scrounging around for as much data as they can get. If you saw the recent New York Times report uh, and often crossing ethical boundaries to do that. And some of that data that they're ingesting is going to repeat ingrained societal biases. So as an experiment I have people do all the time is to, um, you know, try these kind of linguistic tricks with the large language model. Um, you ask chat GPT this sentence, um, the doctor yelled at the nurse because she was late. Who was late? It's going to say the nurse. If you change the pronoun to he, it's still going to say the nurse was late because it it understands the nurse as being uh, gendered as female, regardless of. Sorry, in that case, the second case, it's going to say that the the doctor was late, which makes less sense uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, these are persistent examples that have been talked about. The open AI hasn't fixed. You can reproduce them in lots of these systems. They can put some kind of gloss on top to try to remove the bias, but it's in the training the way that they, they work. 
much safer to use these systems and be aware that they can have bias results and use them in ways where they're not making decisions that can re reflect and perpetuate that bias. People can also be biased. So I don't think that means there's no role for AI anywhere near decision making, but it shouldn't be making those decisions without, um, should be used to inform decision making and maybe to detect and remove bias rather than directly to be making decisions that we just know in some cases will perpetuate it. Thank you. Um, and I think that, you know, runs really well into our last question, question, which is what guidelines, guardrails, or supports, because it seems like that is also something that maybe uh, workers need for those who want to use it in a good way or in a correct way, a useful way. Um, would you recommend or would you consider that policymakers, but also corporations, designers uh, think about? And I think last round, we'll start with Quentin. Um, if everyone can take at sure. the most two minutes, so we have time for a couple right. of <laughs> qu questions. Thanks. All right, well, I'll just say the mirror of what I just expressed, which was this risk of bias and how can we get it out of the systems. The other risk, which is kind of under discussed in my opinion, is the risk of over moderation. And we see that in the legal aid context. You try to ask a legal aid, uh, a standard legal aid question, you know, something get, getting advice on a domestic violence restraining order or someone losing their housing or someone who was dealing with an assault. Uh, the AI tools might refuse to answer because of the moderation that's placed on top of them. So we got to figure out, well, when do we need that? How do we remove it? And how do we just not assume this kind of very vanilla down the road, very safe world people live in? which means that people who aren't dealing with tough living situations are not going to get help from these tools. I'm concerned about that. Um, I, I'm also concerned about kind of raw, unfiltered use of these tools for someone to get legal help, because uh, it can give you, it will give you information, happily give you a suggestion, but it may not have asked the right questions to give you an accurate and complete response. So legal problems, for example, depend on what state you live in, it's certain sometimes even what city or county you live in. And um, you can get great answers from these tools if you give it the right context, but doesn't the tools don't yet ask the right follow-up questions. So I, I want to see some tools that will work for someone who's looking for that kind of help, but will also ask the right follow-up questions. I'm, I'm really interested in that. Great, thank you. Um, Olivia? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of what I mentioned before. I mean, providers uh, want to be included in some of these discussions, and in they, some of them feel that they are that they are not at at all. Um, and it's that sort of, you know, a lot of providers also now uh, are providing a text therapy, right? Which is sort of not chatbot therapy, but it's sort of, you know, a a a version of, you know, it's easier to jump from tech therapy to chatbot therapy, right? And so chatbot therapy is kind of like the the sort of texting interaction, removing the labor of the therapist. And so, um, you know, there are also kind of regulation guidelines and regulation of some of these big entities that providers really want to see as, you know, as many <laughs> mentions, like I am invested in the, in the well-being of my patient but this larger entity is invested in their bottom line and they are a publicly traded company, right? So there's even, you know, um, and this goes for many, many companies that are even, even doing invested in medical care. So um, definitely want to see regulation, but also a, you know, refocus on how um, it's not just conversation that is healing, right? There's many, many ways that are part of collective care that can be therapeutic. And so kind of, trying to get away from just com just conversating with this agent is going to you know have good mental health outcomes but it's kind of the broader inequality that needs to be addressed for people to be well thank you and we'll finish with jeff on this question <clears throat> absolutely thanks uh, i talked about a few of the guardrails i know aft is working on a document about to release it 
we need to infuse into our education system these guardrails and, and guidelines. Um, we need to uh, uh, self-reflect and, and and put these, um, you know, some of them maximizing safety and privacy, promoting human interaction and ind individuality. You know, I kind of mentioned these, but uh, and, and it's kind of self, but we do need our policymakers. Education is very much regulated by policymakers. Um, yeah, in our field, um, whether it's at the state level, at the at the local school board level, uh, whatnot, but they need to be looking at at these and making sure that they're passing rules and regulations, because <clears throat> self regulation in the industry is not always been <laughs> great, and we need to be able to put these on there. Um, but there are a lot of supports um, uh, uh, that we need to be providing uh, professional development. Um, you know. Uh, discussions and, and creation we need to allow the educators to be innovative but they also need to share that innovation with others as we talk about this and we talk about the implication of it so that would be my quick response we definitely need these um we're, we're working on these but we also need policymakers. if we compare this to the social media europe is way ahead of us in making sure that there are guardrails and guidelines for social media where we have never really done that we need to do that here in the U.S. Um, uh, and get some rules on the books um, uh, for this, especially for for labor and all of these industries. Thank you so much, um, all of you, for this great uh, discussion. Um, at this point, we have a couple of questions from the audience, so I will ask them. And um, whoever uh, is motive, moved, please respond. Um, the first question is from Siddhartha. Chauhan, apologies if I mispronounced your name. Question is, how do we decide how much of the tasks can be automated if they are having ethical concerns, micro decision making, or privacy concerns? I'll, a quick answer I would say is, uh, I mean, we just we got to test these and see where they perform. And I, there's this idea of AI as a magic wand, but it, there's things it can do well and, and things that it just will totally fail. So I'd start there. Like, does it even work for what you're trying to get it to do? And give it enough time to understand the impacts on those ethical questions. And you have this framework of, okay, well, does it work? Um, is there a risk of bias in it? Do we feel like we're losing something important, such as our lower level staff to get the training that they're, they're taking away that practice that they would have. I don't have one size fits all, but I think you got to ev individually evaluate it that way. Jeff or Livia, do either of you want to jump in? I, I mean, I, this is a great question. Um, I, I think uh, where does that, where is that line drawn? Um, this is where we really need regulations basically on the privacy concerns. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I know Gmail's reading my emails. Where is that information? Now I know Gmail has, has a big liability at stake to, to try to create that uh, that security that that information isn't attached to my name. But in education, that is something we really have to uh, take care of. So I, I think it's a very good question. Um, how do we decide? I, I think that's something that we, that's something we have to delve into, and that's where we need to bring people together and have this discussion. Where are those guardrails? I think that's very important here. Yeah, and I think the important question always to ask in every conversation is, "Who is we? Who, who is we, and for whom?" Right. That is constantly the, you know, the refrain that you know sometimes the we is. Uh, very opaque. The we has been used to enact a lot of a lot of violence. And so that's how do we do, I mean, and this is part of what DNS is trying to do also is engage different people in the in the creation of these systems, but also seeing how they affect people down the line, right? You don't need to know exactly how um, the intricacies of how it how these systems work to know how they've affected your life. Um, but I think also it's important to do some, um, on many of the therapists that I spoke to were like, I don't really understand what AI is. I just know it's coming. And I, I am too burnt out to really even delve into like understanding this. And so I think, um, you know, uh, 
collective organizing in a way is is one of the ways that we de- we or decide how how it how it happens how these professions change thank you those are great answers to that question um i'm going to skip over the uh to this question that got a couple of upvotes from noella bodart as the use of ai expands who have you seen doing a good job of investing more time consideration into the teaching slash exploration of ethics at large to then inform the application of ethics in the use of AI. And anyone can feel free to jump in. Yeah, I I, I flagged this because I thought it was interesting. There's like there are two groups I I think would be worth mentioning, which uh, the folks who are doing some testing of underwriting of AI systems and how well they do with legal problems if they're safe underwriter at labs surprisingly enough is is doing some of this work um at duke there's the the rails initiative which i think responds for responsible ai in the legal system um suffolk law school where i teach and stanford are two other groups that i, I know lots of folks are thinking about it um but I'm, I'm really excited about the underwriter labs initiative which seems like it's going to be really rigorous Others, Jeff or Olivia? Jeff? I, I just kind of altering the question a little bit about less about the ethical, but organizations that are actually looking in and, and delving this, I just refer to the, the SAG AFTRA and the Writers Guild about actually taking a step ahead and putting in their contracts. I, I view this question more from a labor lens that they're actually putting in their contracts protections of their jobs and how and when to use AI and how it can be used and, and the prevention of that. It does not cover cover every creative organization, um, but it is a standard um, that we're trying to replicate in the educational world as well. And we need to be considering and how to use our collective bargaining power to be able to put some of these guardrails in. Um, could be to discussion about ethics, but just kind of in a lot of broader, bigger perspective of how do we use AI in our industry? Um, a collective bargaining is one of the best ways. I know the, the other two may not be along to unions, but um, uh, that's my perspective. Just from your- 12 years I did in legal aid, which was great. So. That's right. Some lawyers did were part of unions. Livia? Uh, yeah, I think there's, we're seeing also the, I mean, there's a lot of mental health providers and therapists who are uh, not, they're really trying to work and understand how technology is part of mental health care, right? I mean, there's, there's a group called Therapists in Tech that is really uh, invested in understanding how, um, how also some, some um, providers want to switch careers, right? And don't want to do just clinical practice. But we're also seeing, I mean, there's different kinds of alternative platforms, like one of them is Therapy for Black Girls, uh, Inclusive Therapists. So other models that are provider-led and provider-focused that are smaller, uh, that are trying to offer um, alternative and sometimes very radical ways of engaging in in therapeutic relationship that sort of doesn't, um, doesn't participate in these broader systems of exploitations that some of these companies are really doing towards the profession. Thank you. Well, that is our last question. Um, please join me in thanking today's panelists, Livia Garofalo, Jeff Freitas, and Quentin Steinhaus. Um, thank you for joining us on the Zoom today. If you joined us for all three talks, please drop us a note to let us know what you thought. Uh, we would really appreciate the feedback. If you missed a talk, please visit our website for a link to the previous discussions, which were hierarchy and um, <laughs> a recognition. Um, in either case, uh, we hope you'll stay connected and sign up for the Labor and Tech newsletter at the link in the chat that was just put there. Um, and stay tuned for re future research on this topic. Thank you so much, speakers, and everyone for joining us. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.